And here is a small flaw in Gym Leader Matt's rooting. His Parasect only has 156 speed when going up against the Alakazam. That means they are speed tied, allowing the champion to waste more time by selecting Psychic. And it gets a critical hit, finishing Matt's Parasect off. Earthquake gets the KO, and we have ourselves a champion. Ike the Killer finishes Pokemon Yellow. Oftentimes, we learn more from our failure than we do from our success. Having come so tantalizingly close to victory, only to fumble it away at the one yard line in the final seconds, it just doesn't feel great. But just like The Undertaker, the bell tolled, and it's time to sit up for round two. Welcome back to the channel where I do Pokemon solo challenges. We're attempting to rank Pokemon based on optimized routes, mainly focused on generation one and two. In this video, it's for a race for Scott's thoughts. It has slightly different rules, but the rules I normally use, they are in the description, so you can check out down there if you want to know more. And whether you are a new viewer or a returning subscriber like Anthony Freer, sit back, relax, grab yourself a Sodi Pop, and just know I do appreciate the support. This is my second entry for a Scott's Thoughts community race, and we got a surprise with a cross-gen run of Smeargle and this painy little dog boy it revolves around its signature move sketch and we just have to open up talking about that when an opponent uses a move you can use sketch and it's going to add that move to your move pool permanently it's going to replace sketch in the process you can then learn another sketch every 10 levels and the entire crux of the run was using your sketches to get moves from trainers that's going to help you problem solve various areas of the game the first challenge is going to come at the very first rival battle now we'll talk about the stats in a second but smeargle was faster than pretty much anything at the start of the game and if you move first sketch is going to fail because your opponent hasn't used to move yet. You're going to be forced to use struggle strategy here in this early game and when you have recoil damage in play it's no surprise that this opening fight it's a loss more often than it is a win. I will go ahead and say that I had great times with all of the rival teams at this stage in the race. I was just kind of taking whatever the game gives me at this point and the results felt pretty much roughly the same so it was kind of cool to see the rival be fairly insignificant here which is usually something reserved for generation 2. Moving on I'm not going to bore you about all the finest little details there probably are already been covered but losing the rival battle and being in the fast leveling group it means that you're going to miss out on about a quarter of the way through level six so we're only level five here a flat level five so my strat was to struggle early struggle often pretty much like life you'll see here that i see a perfect candidate with a level two rattata and since it's on the way anyway i just take it out we start building up that critical experience so we can hit certain numbers going ahead in the game now let's bring up smirkle stats real quick and honestly just look at this it's pretty pathetic when i do cross gen runs i i take the highest stat between special attack and special defense it's called the chancy rule but scott decided to do the 20 special here and i think it's a very smart move this means that both the attack and special are even and it ensures that both the physical and the special learn sets are going to be viable throughout this race the only thing smeargle has that's any decent at all is speed and even then 75 is not groundbreaking but it is pretty much good enough but in, it's in this unique position here where it's actually a detriment early because it really limits the spot where you can start getting moves at. After fishing for some more easy experience, I do buy early here. The main thing is that I want a ton of potions. I get nine total. It's going to keep me out in the field because we're going to be on that struggle strategy right now. And you can see that in Viridian Forest, I'm just, I'm battling wild Pokemon that I can handle easily. You're going to get low in the process, but a quick potion can just keep you going. And note that I am skipping all the trainers here as well as we start to make our way towards the end. I get really unlucky here. Uh, I don't see the best spawn possible at all until the end. It's Metapod. Like we've learned in the videos like Abra, Metapods are the ideal situation because they don't hit you back and they give solid experience. But at this point, you can see that I'm level seven and the goal here is ultimately level eight for that damage rounding threshold. And once I hit that, I heal up and it's time to take on the mandatory bug catcher. Notice I don't save or anything right here because at this stage of the runs, I was, I was just doing the Brock split with no resets. If anything happened, I would just start over because there's no point in continuing when you're trying to beat a certain time and it's like your 20th run. Overall, level eight here is pretty consistent even if it uses multiple tackles you can still outpace it with struggle you can hang on at the end and we'll talk more about the race soon but I do think that if this race was as long like we had as long to do it as Parasect we would start to see level six mandatory bug catcher attempts just to save a little bit of time but given the small time limit for this iteration of the race safe and consistent play meant you would get more full attempts in I do think that was the way to go I'm very glad this was the case now moving ahead I was initially pretty excited if you watch older videos or streams you know that I love to do light years junior trainer blackout grinding a lot and I thought that it was going to be something that maybe was unique to me 
But as I did it more, I really suspected that this strat is going to be virtually what all the top times are going to do because they're smart. They know what's good. Now, I don't know that for sure because I'm recording this video without really any knowledge of anybody else's run. This is like really short after the race, but it's just kind of a hunch. This strategy feels too good to skip. And here at the Light Years Junior Trainer, it's even more important to the run than just for the experience. Diglett is one of the few Pokemon that's actually faster than you, so that means you're going to be able to comfortably and consistently take Scratch here. It's an unassuming 40 base power move, but compared to something like Struggle, it actually lets you compete in the game and not really, for lack of a better word, struggle. Level 8 feels really good here because pretty much every single time you can sketch the Scratch and you can have enough damage and HP to essentially always win this fight, and then you can just kind of commence the blackout grinding. In Scott's setup, we had to use for the race, you can see that I already have a reset from losing the opening rival battle and when I black out here it gives me another one now this is a tangent this is neither here nor there but to me a reset means that you reset the game you load a previous save blacking out or intentionally losing a battle strategically as a way to progress the game I don't think that's a reset it's a little semantic here I know it is but I'm just saying that I don't agree with the term reset being a counter that increases multiple times in the run when you're not actually resetting at all I think a new name for this little metric here would be better if that's what it was trying to display here but you can tell me what you think I just don't really think it's fair to the strategic choices Smeargle made to make it look like it actually had more resets than it did in my submitted footage I had a very rare scenario happen here generally you can very easily get to level 12 off the light years junior trainer and i've even gotten some attempts where i get to level 13 off of it and things are going pretty normal at the start until i get to the sand shrew and my smeargle it decides that it's just had enough it starts to crit a bunch and i actually win this battle a lot earlier than i was supposed to this kind of throws a wrench in my plans i didn't have any strategy for being this low of a level but it's not too bad it's just i'm worried that's going to take too long but we do have scratch we have another sketch that we learned at level 11 this means that grinding is now significantly easier and the only choice we have is to back to Viridian, we can finish up grinding, we skipped all the trainers, we can get all that done. With our second sketch, there are a couple of ways to get the move we want. Now the fastest way it would be if you got like a lucky level 6 or above Pidgey, or maybe even got that really rare Pidgeotto chance. We want Sand Attack, and it's going to be a crucial part of the game, not only for the Brock split, but later in the game as well. And as we're progressing, I'm going to take out every encounter here, and it's worth noting that originally I routed in an escape rope, just so I can get back to Pewter a little bit earlier, and I even messed with like a blackout strategy uh, when I'm deep into Viridian to save a little bit more travel that way, but in this final iteration here, uh, I just didn't do it. And as we make our way towards the end of this little backtrack, basically if you didn't encounter a Pidgey or a Pidgeotto here, you have to move on to a plan B if you want to get sand attack but my spotty senses here they were tingling and look at me go up for one more encounter and i actually hit the mythical viridian forest one percent pidgeotto encounter but unfortunately uh, it has multiple chances but it doesn't use sand attack once and rather than go for the catch or something like that i do take it out because it gets a solid amount of experience and remember that i'm behind because i didn't win the rival battle and we got through the light years junior trainer a lot earlier than we anticipated outside of there we're gonna heal up in viridian like i said earlier it really felt it felt pretty good to black out or use an escape rope after this section back to pewter but my optimizations it really led to a lot of extra training and i just found that it didn't save any time in that specific case rival 1a is the backup plan here for sand attack spiro it could be annoying you already know but you just pretty much ignore it you take it out and ultimately you want the eb to use sand attack that's what it all relies on now if your time felt really solid here you were ahead of schedule you could just kind of reset a few times and just kind of fish for the sand attack and normally you're gonna have two chances but just like with the junior trainer earlier i crit so i only have one chance it goes for a tail whip i take it out and i just take the win and let's kind of talk about why the thought process for me here is that the run already felt kind of scuffed i'm already behind i lost the rival battle i'm behind on experience i beat the light years junior trainer way quicker than i wanted to i crit in this battle i don't have a flyer yet and i've had a couple of sand attack attempts that just went wrong this meant that i'm going to go back through the forest do what i need to do and when i clean up there and i didn't get a pidgey yet or a sand attack i would just restart the entire run it's no big deal there's not too much time wasted overall and what ends up happening it's just by chance i'm backtracking and my brain was turned off i guess i forgot that i didn't battle a couple of trainers here so i have to double back once again and we finally get that pidgey encounter this time it immediately uses sand attack i sketch it and i just go ahead and catch my flyer for the run now some of you might be thinking this big brain strat and be saying hey matt why didn't you just throw a pokeball it breaks out then you sketch the move after that 
And that, my friends, is specifically a band play. You can't do it. Now, in the case of this, I did legally use sketch first, and then I threw a ball, so that's allowed, but you can't do it the other way around. You can't use a ball with the sole intention of, of learning a move. But what this all boils down to here is that we got sand attack. The run is a go now. I wrap everything up, and at the end, I grind just a tiny bit more. Experience is really tightly routed for this one, and I have a very specific number I want to hit. And a tangent I'm going to go on here, another tangent, is that while the experience bar indicator on Scott's overlay looks fantastic, it doesn't really give you any actual data or numbers. Personally, I'm a numbers guy, and if you wonder why maybe I have it converted to this on my own overlay, it's because I don't want to have to open menus like I do here just to see that exact experience number. That's why you're going to see raw numbers in my video, because at first glance, it might look a little worse, a little bit more amateur on my videos, but I think they're more intuitive, and more importantly, they fit my playstyle better. But eventually, we get to where we need to be in terms of experience, and we can just kind of cap off this section of the game by taking a look at the rock solid Pokemon trainer. Geodude is first, and we can summarize this battle really quick. You're going to go for some sand attacks, and you're going to start scratching your little painty heart out. My rule of thumb here was to use three sand attacks, but Geodude, honestly guys, through all my attempts, Geodude loved to hit tackles through the sand attacks. So here I get a few misses, and I'm like, hey, let's go for four, and then it missed again, and I was like, why not go for five just to make it consistent? And you can see it really works out because I'm at really high health when we're moving on, and we can talk about Onyx, and it's really what you would expect. You have good speed, so you can actually control the bide damage control the flow of the battle. We have 10 sand attacks left, so you do have to be a little bit cautious. So we're throwing a few sand attacks off at the start, and then we're going to start the scratch fest. And you'll notice that sometimes I'll go for scratch during the bide, and it's because when you use one scratch during bide, it only does four damage back. It's not really that much. And just like with the Geodude, this one's going to be slow and steady. And at the end of the day, I finished this split at about 12 minutes and 22 seconds, which honestly, it's a little bit slow. I've had some Brock splits. It's worth noting here. Brock splits in the 10 minute range, and usually all of them were in the 11 minute range no matter what. So it's honestly kind of surprising to see a slower split actually equate to a PB, but that's about all there is to say about Brock. So we are already about 12 minutes through this video and I don't want it just to drag on. I do want to pick up the pace a little bit, but I think it was really important to highlight the early game because it was not only unique, but it was also the one part of the game where you really couldn't control most of the aspects from the rival battle experience, how many times you can repeat the Light Years Junior Trainer, or when, or how quick could you get Sand Attack. All of these things were honestly the most inconsistent parts of the run, and this was the main reset point, which is a pretty great thing since it didn't really take too much time just to hop back in and get another attempt. I didn't mention this, I also got some extra experience so that I could hit level 16 going into the Onyx. I just felt like it gave me a little bit of extra stats and it made it just that much more consistent, but that experience, it also has other implications as we go further as well. As for Route 3 going towards Mount Moon, I battled the standard trainers, but I do pick up this optional bug catcher, and you can see the extra levels in the fast experience group. It lets me hit level 18 in the end. The extra damage rounding threshold, it helps to keep things sort of flowing. And now I think we can talk about Mount Moon for a minute. My goal here is to battle a lot of optional trainers. I'm picking up the super nerd, and then after that I pick up the bug catcher that's located near him, and then I'm picking up the escape rope. Now what I do next is a little bit of a late addition, but I'm going forward and I'm fighting the double grass lass, and then I take a visit down to where Mega Punch is located to fight this optional rocket battle. I want the ether that's hidden down here, but I don't want to use it yet. We're going to talk about that later, but this leads me to yet another weird routing choice I don't know if anybody else is going to do, but I use the escape rope here. I warp back to the entrance, and then we go back into Mount Moon. Now, most of my other runs, I was using the escape rope as soon as I got it, and then I was continuing along the path. I was grabbing some battles, and I was using the ether to make it through, but I wanted to use it in a different spot. I figured going down here two extra levels to a dead-end room just to get to that ether, I, I figured this was the best spot to escape rope, and it would be roughly the same as the other spot I was using it in earlier. Also, fighting two extra battles means that I can save the ether, and we'll, we'll go into that in a minute. With my PP back to full, I do battle the bug catcher south of the Mega Punch location. Then I take on the Rocket Grunt. That Game Freak decided that it was too strong to have Eradicate, so they nerfed it in Pokemon Yellow. Now, this is the conclusion of my extra trainers here, but let me talk about one aspect of the super nerd here at the end. With only two moves, there's a pretty low 
chance that the grammar can just start off with a disable it would hit your scratch and it's going to make you waste a lot of time so this is going to be for a lot of battles here but sand attacking first to lower their chances of being annoying is always the smarter play and lots of battles coming up i'm not going to mention it every single time or show it but tossing a little sand first is just something i did a lot if a battle was even remotely threatening i, I found it just to give you more consistency as for jesse and james i do hit a very specific experience number here i hit level 22 going into the coughing and getting that experience from the coughing was all according to the grand scheme of things and with a little sand attack and some scratches this part of the game really wasn't that bad it was much better than the start it was a little bit tedious because i really wanted the extra levels i wanted to train more in Cerulean, I'm immediately heading to the gym, but not to fight Misty. She's a little bit too tough right now. The easiest way to hit my goals here was to route in her underling trainers rather than do like more wild battles or fight other slower trainers along the way. So I take out the first, and even though I play the golden trainer a little bit more cautious with some sand attacks, it's not bad. And the important thing to take note of here is that I hit level 23 right at the end of the battle. Now when I go get the rare candy before the next big fight, I make a bold decision. I think this is going to be different than any other route here. I'm going to use both of my rare candies. I'm going to hit level 25 and I'm going to explain why, but first let's do that. We'll explain all that while we're talking about rival number two. Level 25 does some really important things for this battle and coming up, but first it puts Sparrow into a pretty comfortable two-shot range, no sand attacks needed. I even create here in the footage, but you'll just have to believe me that it's a pretty nice range on the two-shot. Sandshrew is next, and my strat here for the submission was just to sand attack first. Maybe you can avoid any retaliatory sand attacks, and you can look at this footage and you can see me get sand attacked anyway, and then it starts to snowball, it starts to get really annoying, and after I start missing a lot, I have the awareness to know just stop wasting time, reset, and just go back in. And I'm going to hop back in and you're going to see this attempt go even worse. Now I take a growl, which is, it's not the worst thing in the world. It's pretty annoying. But when you get back to the sand tree, my attack is already debuffed and I take an early sand attack and I'm just not going to be messing around with this. I reset once again. And this fight is very important for reasons we haven't even been able to talk about yet. But I do get growled again and I slog through the sand tree regardless. Now let's get to the very important part of this fight. Now at level 21, you get another sketch and the most crucial thing that we want to have for the, the whole run, it revolves around Hyper Fang. I want to take it from Rattata, and it's unfortunate you have to go through two butthole Pokemon first. I get a little lucky here. I get Hyper Fang real quick, but I do want to talk about the worst feeling in the run, and I'm wondering how many people shared this experience. This Rattata, it also has Quick Attack, and I cannot tell you guys how many resets happened when I would see Rattata use Hyper Fang. I would go to sketch it, and then it would just use Quick Attack, and I would take that instead. It's just, it's one of the most frustrating parts of this route, and it happens so many times. Seriously, it started to affect my psychology to the point to where some runs I would see it use Hyper Fang and I just wouldn't use Sketch because I was afraid of getting baited or getting trolled into taking Quick Attack. So it's really important to, to look at. And now my friends, you would think that things are great. We have Hyper Fang, but remember that we're growled, we're Sand Attack, and I actually have to black out here and I forgot to deposit my Pidgey. So I have to black out by letting my HM Flyer die because keeping the move is just so much more valuable than resetting until this fight goes perfect. But on the next attempt, look how trivial it is when you have Hyper Fang. I also want you guys to know that this fight and all of its resets took me nearly two minutes of just hoping to sketch a move and that was something that you just had to concede in this specific run but when we analyze the end I'm going to show some post race runs that I did and remember time losses like this. Two minutes is pretty big. Now I've said this a hundred times and I'm going to say it again. Nugget Bridge contains the single highest cluster of mandatory battles in the entire game and if you can do anything in your runs to speed it up it's going to pay dividends. You did not need to get to level 25 to get Hyper Fang and I'm sure at least a few people that decided to sketch this move they did it at a much lower level than me but here it just made Smeargle more resilient, I did more damage and it just kind of upped my chances. It didn't really work out for me but that's okay. And now that I'm thinking about it you might be watching this wondering if I even did well in the race because I started the run by wasting like five seconds putting 10 extra P's in my Pokemon name. I had to delete that. Then I had a sub optimal Brock split with several mistakes. And then I wasted a bunch of time here. And spoiler alert, this is not going to be the last time I have some bad luck or waste some time. What was interesting about this race was that there was only four days to do it. And outside of some people maybe talking about the Brock splits, most people really kept quiet and just did their own thing. Everyone was just left to their own devices and they their own routes and their own strategies were allowed 
to really shine through and be unique and it was kind of a glorious feeling. I think this race really embodies the feeling and the spirit of a solo run race perfectly compared to the five week luck fest that Parasect kind of devolved into. And if you want to know anything about the vibe and the feel of the race, it was that perfect luck or mechanical play. They, they're not going to be the deciding factors of this one. It's going to be the planning, the execution, and your choices to navigate the game efficiently. And those are what's going to do well in this race. It was really refreshing to feel this experience. Now let's talk about Hyperfang just a little bit. It's just a shade weaker than Body Slam, and most people consider that move to be one of the best in the game, but Hyperfang only has 90% accuracy. Now I'm honestly really surprised that so many people are turned off by 90% accuracy. I'd go as far to say that most people probably never even tested this thing out for themselves, and they just kind of parrot somebody else's thoughts on the matter. And when you do that, I think you lose the critical thinking aspect, and I feel like experiencing something for yourself is just something that can't really be substituted. What turned me on to the move personally was the fact that I recently did a Rattata run in Pokemon Yellow and what Hyperfang did for the early game in that run it really impressed me and that's kind of where I decided to start developing this strategy. As for level 25 the numbers let me do significantly more damage and it sped up this section of the game and I really hope that people doing their own runs pick up on how important this part of the game is. The ether I saved from Mount Moon earlier was also used here. I did that so I can save the elixir that I'm going to get later for a later segment. But the main reason for level 25 comes at the end of the round. Now honestly, I didn't account or plan for the blackout experience on rival number two, so my experience is a little bit off, but even without that extra experience, I would hit level 28 on this final trainer here, but all you need to know about level 28, it was really important for the next big fight. And this is where I'm gonna be curious about other routes. I don't skip Misty, and you'll see how easy this fight is with the damage rounding from 28 and the fact that you outspeed star me. There's not really much to say other than the extra training led to this moment here, and if other routes had to skip Misty, backtrack, it means they would also have to skip Surge later and backtrack to that, and I just didn't want to do that. I, I, if I can avoid that, I will. The goal of my routing was to take on all challenges as I came to them, but let's keep going. As for the route down to Vermilion, I'm able to easily beat everything, and as far as the shop buy goes, I'm buying a ton of extra super potions because Smeargle, he needs them for consistency. It's a very squishy Pokemon. After that, the elixir I saved earlier and the ethers start to come into play. I'm going to route 11 for some extra battles once again. Now, I made the call to skip the single Magnemite engineer here to make up for that extra experience from the Blackout on Rival 2 earlier. Hopefully, it'll save some time. Um, but I'm taking on the super nerd here with two Magnemites and a Magneton. Maximizing Hyper Fangs, it's absolutely crucial during this part of the game. And if you count the Elixir and the two Ethers I'll have access to, it gives me 45 uses of Hyper Fang. And the more you can use this move, the faster it's going to be. I also take on the Youngster right above the Engineer. He has a couple of Rattatas and Eradicate. And then we can just continue extra training down on the SSN. Down in the basement, I'm going to be picking up several battles as well as getting things like the Max Potion and the Ether. But there's going to be four total battles here. They include the first sailor in the second room, there's a sailor in the third room as well, the fourth room of the rest has another sailor, and in the fifth room I'm fighting only the first fisherman before progressing. Then two doors down from the gentleman candy room, I take on the trainers here. The first, it's a very easy fisherman, and the second fight is a fight I didn't like. We'll talk about more, we'll see why I didn't like it. I was bold, I didn't save, I didn't heal, and I'm punished with a self-destruct that forces a reset. Not only that, but I only saved before the first fisherman so I have to redo that battle again and once again I have to say watching this run back makes me wonder how I even did any good in the race. I'd also like to talk about why I battle the electric gentleman. He's guarding a max elixir and I don't necessarily need that but there were so many times where I would accidentally use sketch and the max ether here was kind of like a backup plan a just in case so that if I use that I could restore the PP without just making it a dead run and have to redo the whole thing over again. But the gentleman candy it's just an easy two shot we can move on to Rival 3, and there's not really going to be much to say here. I just want you to visualize and understand how much work Hyper Fang is doing for this run. It really, I can't stress enough, it really sped up the game, and it's starting to offset the extra time I put in earlier to train. And when we are done with this, we just hit level 34, and we're nearing the end of the master plan with all the extra stuff we've been building towards. After I get cut and teach it to my Charmander, you'll see that I'm using yet another early candy to hit level 35, just like with level 25 early. Earlier, there's some really big implications for this and we'll cover that soon. I'm really just wondering how much higher of a level I am compared to the other runs. Now I'm going to head over to Diglett Cave and you'll need to at least find a level 19 Diglett and you'll see here I find several without Dig before I finally find the right one. It takes a little bit. Now I'm going to call this out here because this is a time waste that I corrected post race. You can comfortably just go ahead 
ahead and take on Surge at level 35 with Hyper Fang. And you can just come here in your standard route. You can take Dig and then you can use that to go back to Cerulean without any extra backtracking or time loss. It feels better, but this is just another one of those kind of suboptimal time losses that are already kind of piling up in the run. As for Surge, I already said that Hyper Fang was good enough, but Dig is just overkill. This one goes exactly how you would expect. I do take a Growl here, but it's insignificant. But remember earlier about not skipping Misty? It let me do Surge now and not having to backtrack to this later felt really good. Now we're gonna go over some things that level 35 let me accomplish. Let me go on record to say that I think that the Route 9 to Rock Tunnel, then all the way to Celadon, I think it's one of the slowest parts in the game. And just like with Nugget Bridge, choosing to go through this cluster of the game several levels lower is not only really slow, but it's also a little bit painful and it can be a little inconsistent. The entire focus of my route was to test and see how feasible it was to train up to this level, make this section overall faster, and let's kinda just go over what it does for us exactly. First up is the Wrapping Junior Trainer. Level 35 is a guaranteed one hit on every Pokemon, meaning you don't have to save. You can just boom, 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 and just move on. Second is the Cubone and the two Slowpokes you'll fight down here. They're not guaranteed two shots, but it does give you a pretty solid range. And I don't even get it here, but it still speeds up the process. Then on the Mandatory Grass Junior Trainer, it puts Oddish in a pretty good range, but once again, I don't get it here. I also use Scratch on the Bulbasaur because I want to preserve some Hyper Fangs. But the main time save is just the chance at having those one shots and just like some other things it didn't work out for me here that's fine but the theory was really solid and I really just want to say that I wasn't scared of rock tono at all I barely even had to save in here if I didn't want to that's what I'm trying to say as for the self-destruct hacker very easy fight I'm level 36 by this point and I have a near 70% chance to one hit the geodudes and you're gonna see me just crit the graveler and I think that a lot of other runs are probably just using sand attack here and hoping that they would miss it doesn't sound great so I've said this a couple of times I'm just interested to see how the other people did this kind of stuff. After cleaning up, I do battle the Poison Super Nerd that has two Grimers and a Muck, and you might be surprised to hear that there's barely any optional battles left in the game. We're pretty much going to start cruising soon. In Celadon, I'm going into the hideout first, and after the Parasect video, I suspect that people are never going to skip this candy again because it only takes 20 seconds. You get in and out, and it's something that it's always worth it over extra battles. I do pick up a PP up here, and it was something that I would cut out post-race, but it felt pretty good, but it just wasted a little time, and I just want to let you guys know like the things that I think were useless during this footage we're watching now that I cleaned up later. As for buying, nothing too interesting here. Vitamins really don't help out Schmeargle much, and outside of the Pokedaw, I do waste a lot of time here. I did not plan on that blackout losing my money for rival number two, so I have to kind of wing it on the fly here. And I have to buy a top floor TM, which wastes a little bit of time, and overall I get three proteins for the run. Keep in mind that the fastest strat uh, that I would find later is to not even worry about vitamins, just don't buy any, but that's something that we'll talk about at the end. Moving on to Pokemon Tower, the increased levels makes this beyond easy as you would probably suspect. The only thing that could happen Happen here is maybe a mirror move hyper fang you get flinched and then maybe you get crit but all we do we see a leer here that's it and we essentially one shot everything dig for the ghastlies make it easy and jesse and james are weak to dig as well we can just keep it rolling Now we are skipping ahead to the Safari Zone. Standard things like the vitamins, the full restores, the final HMs of the run, that's the goal here. And just like the Parasect race, once again, I'm going for a half seal. On the 10th floor, the Machoke Grunt, honestly, a really scary fight. You really have to put some respect on its name. It can murder you with low kick, and it's the worst part about coming here now. But when you finally get past him, the rare candy is the main reason for going to Sylph now. And we're also going to be fighting some specific battles in a certain order. On the fifth floor, I take on the scientist here. Every Pokemon he has is weak to dig, but Hyper Fang does have better ranges here and there. Dig can finish off the fight, but the main thing here is that the order I've done things in, I'm going to hit exactly level 41 at the end. 41 is good because you get the next sketch and we can start to work on our next sketch target but let's go over yet another weird quirk of my routing i'm going to go ahead and use all four rare candies that i have to get to level 45 and then we're going to head down to the third floor and we're going to pick up one last battle against the electrode and wheezing scientist it's behind the warp near rival number five now with that experience gained i'm done with Sylph for now i'm going to dig out heal up and now let's make our way to erica but first i need to cover a very important battle
The middle stage cool trainer gets an intro today and this is our sketch target. I want sleep powder and the only way you're going to get it is to sand the tank. Hope it not only uses but misses sleep powder then you sketch it. Now here I get about the best case scenario. I use sand attack, it misses wrap, I sand attack again, it uses sleep powder, it misses and I take it. And just like that we have one of the hardest moves to get in the game and this doesn't look too difficult right here but just like rival number two with hyper fang you can see how this could have went because I was wasting a lot of time here and a lot of practice runs and even though we get it really quick here highlighting and talking about it for the context is important to understand the race and this route and I didn't want to get this move anywhere else because I didn't want to backtrack or do anything extra from here on out if I could help it and this result was great as for Erica she's really simple sleep powder works wonders here and with our increased levels, Hyper Fang is a two shot on the relevant Pokemon not named Tangela. I don't even have perfect luck here. I actually get put to sleep on the gloom, but I do wake up, finish it off, and that's the battle over. Down in Fuchsia once again, the Psychic Trainers aren't great. They don't feel good to fight. And we can't have that nice turn economy here today like on the last run. But with Sleep Powder or maybe even some Brute Force, it's fine. My experience like the rest of the run is meticulously planned. And going into Koga, I use an Elixir to get Hyper Fang's PP back up. And now, let's take a look at this one. I would say this is the hardest battle in the entire run. This battle comes down to one thing, hitting Sleep Powder and mowing them down with Hyper Fang. There's really not much else to say, we can't really go into much detail, it's just kind of up to the RNG of Sleep Hitting. I get a pretty solid battle here, and now we can just start to talk about the significance of level 47. I didn't buy any extra Carbos, I only used two free ones in the run, and that means that I outspeed Venomoth by exactly one point of speed, and that lets me move first, and we can execute the same strategy here. I wrestle control of the fight, and I want to talk about the placement and the significance of Koga a little bit more as this battle ends. Koga gives you access to Surf, and in a run where you can pick any move you want, Spore is the best choice. You guys know how I feel about Spore, I think it's the most broken move in the game, and there are two trainers in the game where you could take it, but the only one you can get pre-elite four is going to be locked behind Surf. I decided in the end that it just wasn't worth it. I valued the overleveling in the early game over trying to get the Spore strategy to work, but my whole first day of this race I was really devoted to trying to get a solid Spore strat, but it just never really came to be. I do think I think Otto utilized it very well, but it didn't mesh well with my other goals, so I scrapped it. But Spore is available, I just couldn't find the time to get it. Now after this, we're quickly approaching the bowling point for Smeargle. Things are going to start going really fast. I take a brisk swim down to Cinnabar today, but it's not to face Blaine. I'm interested in completing the Pokemon Mansion, and getting the two candies here are the main thing that you need to look out for. Now we're going to go pick up the Strength Rare Candy, and I'm going to use all three of those candies, and that's going to let us hit level 51, and it's going to get us access to the final sketch that we're going to use for the run. This has us racing on Route 14. I don't think we've ever been here in any of my runs. We're looking for a very specific trainer. And this bird catcher right here, he's going to complete the Exodia for the Schmeargle run. This is one of the two trainers in the game that have Swords Dance. And this bird catcher has a single Farfetch. The other one has like four total Pokemon. But he's the target today. Remember, we just placed Sand Attack. I don't know why I said remember. I don't even think I mentioned that. But we don't have Sand Attack. So to get this move, we have to use Dig, go underground. And then we're going to fail the Dig because it's a flying top. And on the next turn, we hope it uses Swords Dance. Honestly, this one goes pretty quick, just like Sleep Powder. And just like that one, I had planned and counted on these two things, wasting a lot of time. So even though we wasted a lot of time early, rival number two cost a lot of time, the Brock split wasn't great. At this point, I'm pretty sure we made up all that time by being pretty lucky in these two spots alone. Now we're going to start to a rapid fire. We're going to pick up the pace. We can start right here at rival number five. And you're going to see why very few battles are going to have intros anymore because Miracle is quite strong at this point. Fast speed, sleep status, Swords Dance to boost our damage. It puts us into a position where a battle like this is going to be a very common occurrence. We may only have 20 base attack, but we have all the tools necessary to absolutely crush battles like this. And all that work we've done earlier in the game, it's leading us to this extremely quick late game. 
After that, we're straight to Sabrina, and all, you can do this in any order. The Kadabra would work, you could just one shot the Abra and just move on to it, but I felt like Abra was safer. One Swords Dance is the fastest, but two gives you that guaranteed range on Alakazam, whereas if you only used one, it would be like a quarter chance it survives, but here you can see it doesn't matter because I crit anyway. Alakazam just wastes its turn, and the outcome is just the same. Now we're looking at Blaine, and we don't have to say the strat. We already know the strat by now. Just like Sabrina, two Swords Dance is faster, but since I wanted to not lose a battle. I set up three swords dance to guarantee that Arcanine range and just like that it's the final gym. Tombstoner brother. You didn't think I forgot about that did you? Giovanni is roughly the same and I don't want to be a broken record here. Three swords dance gives you like a 30% one shot range on Rhydon and since it hits so hard I wanted to fully set up to give myself the best chance. There are lots of times where you would just crit in this run and it would absolutely ruin your strats but here we don't see that. We don't see me get double kick crit by the Nitos or something like that and by the time we reach the end we get blessed with a patented guard spec by Silfco even though the Dawn survived and we can just keep this breakneck pace going. Rival number six is essentially the same as rival number five, but with a little bit more bulk on his team, you can set up most of his Pokemon are pretty much inconsequential. Executing Kadabra not being evolved makes them extra squishy, and you don't even need to dig on things like Ninetales and Magneton, but Vaporeon is where it gets a little bit tricky. It's starting to get extremely tanky, and it has very strong stab moves, and at least for now, plus six on your attack makes this one pretty easy, but just remember Vaporeon for later as we get through this battle with another Hyper Fang sweep. Now's the part of the game where I injected just a little bit more extra training for the league. The inherent luck involved in a sleep powder strategy along with 20 base attack, it means that more damage is nice for some consistency. And after picking up the victory road candy, I take on just two trainers found on the same floor. They're fairly simple battles as you could probably guess. And at the end, it lets me perfectly hit level 59. And that means I can use that last candy to get me to a nice round level 60. And without wasting any more time, the elite four is here. And I think we should just dive in and see how it goes. First up is Lorelai, and I pray to God that this isn't my Alakazam crit moment from the last race. Despite the careful planning, everything goes wrong here. Now level 60 does give you nice ranges on the one shot for the Dugong, and the three swords dance and the strats stay the same as they have been as we progress on. Now I'm going to blame my notes for this one. I put down Risky Cloister in my notes just to go straight Hopper Fang, and this is, it gets me. I get hit with an Ice Beam, and I get frozen, and it forces a reset, but one reset, not too bad, not too much time loss, let's go back in. On the next attempt, we see the bad side of moves with less than 100% accuracy. First, I want you to see how much damage this bubble beam does, and it gets the speed drop, which really doesn't matter. And then I fell some more trying to get set up, and I take another move, dropping me down to the red health before I eventually get it together, and we take it out. At this point, I'm so low, I pretty much have to hit every sleep powder, and of course, I'm going to immediately miss. I get hit with a clamp, and I'm hemorrhaging time at this point. On the third attempt, I'm starting to tilt. I accidentally hit the swords dance, and I get hit hit hard in retaliation. Things look good, but I missed the one shot range. And in this instance, going for that one shot instead of putting it to sleep, it cost me another hit and my health. And this one's already looking dire once again. And the cloister, it gives me a scare, but it misses. I put it to sleep and finally we're moving on. And on the slow bro, once again, guys, I missed the sleep powder. I suffer a third brutal reset in this fight. And at this point, I'm very upset at the RNG gods for turning on me this late in the run, but I gotta get back into it. The clock is ticking. Skipping ahead to the slow bro in the fourth attempt, I'm already confused, that's all you need to know. I fight it, but I do miss the sleep powder once again, and I take a psychic that's getting me deep into the yellow health, and at this point, I was debating on just restarting the whole run, but I take a deep breath, I hit the moves, and now we can move on deeper into the fight once again to the Jinx. And I'm just gonna let Hyper Fang do its job here. It's a guaranteed one shot, no sleep powder required, and if I would have missed this, I would have taken it as a sign, I would just have withdrawn from the race, honestly. It does hit, we don't have to have a mental breakdown. And finally, on the Lapras, sleep does connect and it allows me to do what I need to do. And guys, you can normally make it through Loreline about 
30 seconds. It took me about two minutes here and I was pretty crushed to be honest because I wanted my submission to be sub hour, but let's not get down, let's not talk about that, we still have a job to do. Bruno was another pretty simple battle that wastes a lot of time. I want to play it safe, I, I want to put the onyx to sleep and I want to set up here, but it fails and it starts taking too long. There's even some X defense for good measure that makes it take even longer. Now it's annoying, but the reason why you'd want three set up here is for the Machamp ranges. Submission can be really scary and by the time I make it through the hit mine, the second onyx gets an x defend to waste even more time and since i couldn't afford another reset i have to do safe strats i have to put the machamp to sleep that cost me even more time i waste even more time missing but on the bright side it's at least a one shot we can still move on there's no resets here in this run honestly agus that's not too bad at all like a lot of fights how many times you set up is going to be the question two times is good enough for everything else but you only have a 57 percent one shot range on the go bat but i know i do have to take the risk here just so i can save any time i possibly can it actually works out for me here, and I'm able to pretty cleanly move on. This fight was pretty easy. As for Lance, Gyarados tries to waste more time, but at the end of the day, it only takes about 13 seconds to wrestle control. We get that full setup, and we can move on. On the safe strat, I would just go for dig on the Dragonairs because it's 100% accuracy, but here, I know I'm going to need to go straight Hyper Fang just to save some turns, and I hit them. Maybe the luck's turning around because I don't miss, and now let's talk about Aerodactyl real quick. This thing can be a menace. If you don't plan your experience, it will outspeed you. It it crits a lot and we only have resisted damage on top of all that. Hyperfang can two shot it, it can get pretty annoying, but at this point I'm just going for the YOLO strats. I end up getting the flinch and I take this thing out without having to worry about any crits or anything like that. For Dragonite, you really do need to put this thing to sleep because it's just too dangerous to be left alive. It loves to crit. Just like the last Pokemon, two things are needed and despite the early hiccups, you can see that the Elite Four is pretty consistent outside of Lorelei. Now I think we're ready for the final challenge. Sand Slash is first, and you know the strat by this point. To no one's shock, I don't want to tank an Earthquake, so Sleep is on the menu. I want a full setup, and things go exactly how you draw it up. Things look good here. Alakazam is next. Hyper Fang hitting is the only variable here. No Sleep required, and the 90% comes through. We get that quick KO, and just seeing this thing gives me like Parasect flashbacks. Executor is next, and the YOLO strat is something I worked on here, but I know if I get put to sleep, I'm just going to lose so much time. And at this point, I'm looking at the clock. I'm just going for like a sub 102. The sleep hits, two fangs do take it out, and at this point the next two Pokemon are simple. I go for dig just to be safe with the guaranteed hit and the super effective damage, and unless I got a gen 1 miss, there's really nothing that the AI can do about it. And just like that, we are at the end of the fight. Vaporeon is up, and I'm going for the YOLO just to hit that sub 102, but I do miss, and I take some pretty decent damage. At this point, I'm getting scared. I swap to a sleep powder, and I'm missing, and I'm getting a little worried at this point. I take a quick attack, but my second sleep lands after that first one misses, and even though it wakes up after the first fang, the battle is over, and one more hyper fang to the dome, it ends the battle. And this ends my Smeargle submission with a time of 1 hour, 2 minutes, and 3 seconds. Now like I've already said, I don't know how I did, but like last time, I think it was pretty good. And you can see that overall my run was really sloppy. There was easily several minutes of time lost throughout the run, but at the end of the day, I'm just glad this race wasn't one of those where you just ran it over and over just going for perfect sequences. Now after the times and the strats were revealed after the race, some people just kept running it. And even I did a few runs after just to see if I could get that time, but honestly, it's just not that interesting to me. Nothing's at stake. I don't want to keep grinding over and over, maybe taking other people's strats just to improve upon my own time. So I'm just going to leave this one here. I really did think about grinding that sub hour since it's clearly possible. I probably would have got it this run if I didn't have bad luck. But quite frankly, I just don't think it's worth the time investment. Now at the end, I'm not overly happy with this run, but the fact that this one was actually really good and I made so many mistakes, it makes it that much more interesting overall. But I think that's about it for me. Smeargle's not going to be on my cross-gen tier list because it's not very good and I don't want to do the run under my own rule set again so that's going to be the end of this video. Special shout out to my channel members and Patreons. I appreciate the support and if you want access to cross gen patches that I do you can go ahead and do that and I'm not sure when this one's going to be out. Like I said I got on the ball immediately and I recorded this video right after the race so that my thoughts and my everything like that was just fresh with the race on my brain so yeah that's it for me. I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye.